So we got, oh, also it is the end of the six weeks. So we do have the, there was like 4.1 homework and the unit two progress checks. So the, uh, the unit two progress checks, uh, some of those are pretty tricky um, on multiple choice side. And so just uh, tempt your best. And then there will be like a, uh, like a relative curve compared to you know all your other classmates. So I'll deal with that over the weekend, but make sure to get those in because grades are, are due. Um, yeah, okay. So we're gonna talk about experiments. Uh, this first one's about like observation versus experiment, and then we'll get into confounding, uh, treatment, setting up an experiment, placebo effect. All right, so this, uh, where we're setting at, the setting here is last year at this high school, they offered an after school SAT prep class that students could volunteer to take. 44 students took the course and took the SAT. The average SAT for that group was 1220. And the SAT score for other students not taking the prep class was 1050. Um, is the situation described an observational or experiment? And the difference between the two. So the difference is observational, we're, we're just observing like what someone chose to do, like they got to choose or whatever, or they did something. Experiment is I specifically like gave you, assigned a treatment to you. So did we do that here? Um, I would say no, because students, oops, oh, there we go, all right. Students volunteered to take it. So like they got to choose to take the prep class or not. Like they were signed up for the SAT and 44 students just happened to choose to take it. So that's observational. Um, so basically no one assigned a treatment there. So no one was assigned the treatment. That's an observational study. Um, okay, identify the explanatory and the response variables. So there's two variables that we're looking at. Um, the way I like to think about these first is I, I just I look at the response and then the variable. So the response was like what were we comparing, what were we looking for? Uh, it was the SAT scores. That's what we were. That's what we were looking for. Was there? But in the end of the day, we were saying we were comparing the two SAT score averages. And the explanatory variable was like, what were they looking at the differences between? And it looks like it was the SAT prep class or no prep class. So did they take that SAT prep class or not? So the response is like your outcome that you're looking for. The explanatory is like, what are we seeing to predict one or the other? So what were we testing basically? All right, number three, can you conclude that taking the prep course will cause a student's SAT score to increase? Why or why not? Um, so do we think that from these kids volunteering to take it, that they are guaranteed to have a better uh, SAT score? Um, I would say no. And like, what's a reason why one of those, why those kids who volunteered to take that test might have had a better score than the kids who didn't take the after school prep class? Think of an example. They care more. What's that? They care more. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, so no, like, probably if they're gonna take a prep class, they probably, yeah, they probably care. That's probably a good one. So no. Uh, if doing a uh, prep class, maybe they care more. 
Sure. That's a good one. Um, so identify as many other possible variables that you could explain why those might be higher. So what are some like more examples? Um, so maybe care more of this. See, I'll just see what I have. Like, um, so yeah, they care, they want to do well, like they're really trying to get into a certain college or whatever. So like that's what I put on one of them. Like, uh, need high SAT for college. Beautiful handwriting. Um, let's see. What are some other examples? Why the prep? So they volunteered. They care. They want to do better on SAT. Um, maybe another example is that, uh, like maybe they, if they took the initiative to do that prep class, they probably did some more studying besides that. So maybe they did other uh, studying. So um, volunteer kids might have done even more studying. So like there's some sort of, they were volunteering to take that prep class, they really wanted it, they're probably putting in some extra work. There's some other things that are happening that are affecting it. It's not just, because we're doing a, an observational study, we're just observing what's happening, so there could be a lot of other variables in the mix as to why this happened here. So what <laughs> these are called, this little mixture of things that could be um, affecting it outside of taking the prep class or not, those are called uh, confounding variables. So confounding variables are things that like are affecting your outcome that are not your explanatory variable. So any other thing that could have been happening in there could be confounding. And we don't want confounding variables. We want to like limit those as much as possible. Because like if I really want to know if my prep class is good or not, I want to have the least the least variation in all these other things. I want to make sure that it really is my prep class that's making it good or not. Um, so yeah, if you have any other factors that are that are like ruining or maybe not ruining, but uh, affecting your experiment, those are called confounding. All right. Um, so I'm going to draw an outline here on number five as to an experiment. So design an experiment that would allow you to determine if the SAT prep causes an increase in SAT scores. So I'm going to draw a just basic model. You could just write this out in a paragraph, but I kind of like to draw the flow chart instead. And so what these are is just like a completely random design experiment is what it would be called. So you kind of start with your population or your sample. So they didn't give us a number. Let's say we start out with like 100 students. So I have my 100 students that are signed up for the SAT. Maybe I should. So 100 students taking SAT. Because if they're there would be no point in putting them through a prep class if they weren't. So I have my 100 students taking the SAT. I want to split them into two groups. And I want to point out that I am going to be randomly assigning them. So random, random assignment. So random assignment is going to make sure that those 100 students, inside of those 100 students are some students that really care, some students that are studying a lot, some students that just show up on Saturday and take the test, uh, some students that are already in the top 10% and are automatically accepted and don't care about their SAT as much, some students that really need a good SAT score, 
So here's everybody, and if I split them randomly, uh, I'm just gonna label that group one has 50 students, group two has 50 students. So if I randomly assign them, each of these groups should have um, like similar, similar grouping to one another. Like they're both representative of everybody if I randomly assign them. They both have students who really did a lot of studying and some who didn't. So I split them into groups and then I'm gonna give this group uh, let's say I, these, this group's going to go through the SAT prep class and this group's going to have no prep class and then the last step is that I take those two groups and I'm going to then compare their SAT scores that they got. So this is your run-of-the-mill basic experiment where I'm just taking everybody I have, split randomly assign them into two groups, give one one treatment, one the other, and then compare. So uh, I have like this is almost like my control group, like what they would do with no testing. This is like my, they got an experiment and I'm gonna compare their results. Um, and then the random assignment is gonna make sure, is gonna try and make sure that these groups are even so that this group is evenly compared to, but does the SAT prep class actually make the scores go up? And then that would be fine. You can just like draw a picture of it, kind of draw it out. Okay. So, um, let's see. Big idea. Uh, we kind of talked about through it, so I'm not really gonna write. So you got observational versus experiment, which experiment is just you actually assign a treatment to somebody. Uh, You've got your explanatory and response. And I guess the biggest thing is like confounding. So confounding variables are, you just have to be aware of them. Like they're there. And if you acknowledge them and try and separate them out, then it'll help your experiment. Like I acknowledge that some students are taking extra time to really practice for this and some aren't. So I'm gonna really try and randomly assign to affect those. So confounding is one of those main things there. So let's look at these two things. Right. Does, does reducing screen brightness increase battery life in laptop computers? So to find out, we did, uh, we got 30 laptops of the same brand and they chose 15 of them at random to adjust their screens to the brightness setting, uh, to the brightest setting, and the other 15 were just left at default. Um, researchers then measured how long the battery lasted. Was this observational or experiment? Yeah, so this is experiment because I was specifically uh, adjusting the brightness or I left it at default. So I didn't like leave it up to chance. Uh, observational study would be like I surveyed 30 people and asked them do they have their screens on the brightest level or at default. Uh, kind of go from there. So it's experiment because uh, basically assign 15 to Right, 15 to default. So I specifically gave them their treatment. All right. Okay. Uh, two, two, four. 
um, is does eating dinner with your family improve students academic performance according to an ABC news article teenagers who eat with their families at least five times a week are more likely to get better grades in school this finding was based on a sample survey conducted by Columbia University was this observational or Just, okay. yeah, on this one, uh, we did not force people to eat with their families five times a week. We just asked them whether they did it or not. It'd be interesting if we did force them, uh, but observational. So we just simply, we didn't assign them five days a week with their family. We just asked them what was happening. So observational, so basically you could say like nothing assigned to the individuals. Uh, so explanatory and response. So you've got uh, the response that we're looking for is how well their grades are in school. So the response is their grades. And the thing we're trying to say explains that or predicts that, at least this article was, was do they eat with their family or not? So explanatory was eating with family and the response was grades. Okay, so explain clearly why such a study cannot establish cause and effect relationship, suggest a variable that may be confounded with whether families eat dinner together. So, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say so it's observational. So because it's observational, we can't say cause and effect. You can just say correlation or not. Like there's an association between these two. So, um, so you cannot, say causation from observation and then so I, I can't say cause and effect causation uh, from just observing I can just say I have a strong correlation and I don't know one thing that could be confounded there like one thing that might actually be affecting their grades other than just eating with their family. It could be, I don't eat with my family five times a week because I work like three nights a week or something like that. I could do whatever. So that could be one right there. So like a confounding variable is like um, work at night or like your, you or your parents or whatever. Um, you could be, it could be anything. It could be like something random, like the amount of sleep you get at night. It could be the teacher that the kid has. Like there could be so many other factors um, rather than just like that one, do they eat with their family or not? So just by observing that. So do, the, do you work at night? It could just be like, are you getting enough sleep? It could be, the teacher you have, if they're not all having the same teacher, one's grading different than another. There could be lots of different things at play that affect your grade. Um, do you have like a class that has like some rowdy kids in it that make it hard to learn? Or do you have like a very peaceful class? All these different variables. So uh, what you want to do, if you were making an, an experiment from this, is we would want to try and limit the confounding variables. We would want to try and like make sure those are controlled in some way. So like, I get all the kids from the same class. I group kids together that have about the same sleep schedule or like that work. Like, oh, here's a group of kids that work versus group of kids who don't have work after school, stuff like that. So having to take into account that
there are variables besides just your experiment. Okay, so that's lesson number one. So we've got confounding variable, uh, experiments, setting up an experiment, difference between observational and experiment. Um, go from there. All right, so let's try this out. this out there's a video we're gonna watch on good morning america a wonderful video look at you Oops. behavior as the social oh. experiment continues on this network abc's nick watt the host of a great new show wouldn't you fall for that joins us now from los angeles and nick tonight you are putting the placebo effect we hear so much about to the test that's right, Josh. I mean, you know that we're all about science on this show. Well, not quite. It's a lot of fun as well. Tonight, the placebo effect. If you think something's going to make you feel better, then it might. And it's summertime, so for this one, we headed to the beach. We set up a booth on the boardwalk of the beautiful Jersey Shore in one sweltering hot day. We told vacationers we're shooting an infomercial for fabulous new energy drinks. We had t-shirts and posters. We even had our very own whiskey. So, this little video, like they, we're trying to see, can I give you a drink that you think you're gonna, you know, have some energy. Uh, you know, but I don't really like that experiment because like, you know, your first time they give you that and then like maybe it's just because you got a second whack at it that you knew how to hit it stronger. But, you know, I guess the point of the video was to try and prove that I can give someone a drink and they can feel better. And they also didn't show us all the other people so it kind of makes me question those people, but anyways, there's a there's a video of like the general idea of a placebo effect. So, like when uh, I, I generally think about this with like a like an like Advil or something. If they're testing their new drug or like some sort of I don't know, it could be an energy or vitamin pill or something. So like in a pill, it's pretty easy to have a placebo. Like I give you like a pill with absolutely nothing in it and it looks the exact same as the pill that actually has the stuff in it and so then it gives you a nice control group so this group has nothing they just got a pill that has nothing and this group has the actual vitamin or advil or whatever in it and you can see the difference between the two 
So um, that's kind of the idea of uh, giving a placebo, but the placebo effect is, is that sometimes some people, just because they're taking a pill, they then all of a sudden would report that they feel better or that their symptoms are going away. So in an experiment, if you're doing some blind uh, testing like that, you have to be aware that sometimes there's just uh, an effect like that. So I heard of that one. So why do you think people in the video got stronger? Well, we're just going to go with what they were saying that they think the inner, they think the drink gave them energy is basically the idea. So what was happening in the video? Um, they thought they were supposed to get stronger with their energy drink. That's the idea. Okay, so we're going to kind of analyze uh, a little experiment these people were doing. See what's up. So similar to the video, uh, this teacher was wanting to use a beverage to test the effect that caffeine can have on heart rate. So what she did was she measured initial pulse rate, gave each student some caffeine, so some Coca-Cola, waited a little bit, measured the final pulse rate, compared the final initial rates. Alright, so what are some problems with this plan? What other variables will be sources of variability in the pulse rate? So I'll just make a list of what I had. So what are some problems is that um, maybe, so like we're, we're basically trying to affect, see the effect of caffeine on pulse rate. But um, in Coca-Cola, there's like a ton of sugar in a soda. And so maybe sugar was the one increasing pulse rate. So problem number one is that sugar uh, could increase pulse wow wow pulse just the board okay so sugar could increase pulse uh think about this you could have someone who already had like coffee that day or coca-cola someone's already had caffeine so there's another thing so um people who had caffeine um, so sugar increases pulse rate people who already have caffeine um, and yeah I mean I think that's pretty good so sugar increases pulse rate so what we want to do go back to number two propose a problem to solve each one so in an experiment we want to make sure we're only uh, kind of finding what we want to. So I need to make sure to control any other variable. So like if I only want to look at caffeine, maybe I need to get like a sugar-free Coca-Cola or black coffee that doesn't have any sugar in it. You know, like so um, kind of the idea is try and control as much of your experience as, as possible. So I need to control all other variables not being tested. So like I don't really want to know what the effect of sugar is. I want to know caffeine. Like, well, it's not a very good idea there on caffeine. Or people who already had caffeine versus people who haven't. Um, so that's kind of the idea of uh, having like a control group. So having a control group is like setting a baseline for who's flat rate. Like here you are at your resting um, pulse rate. So I have like a control group um, that they're all the same. So I don't, I don't necessarily want people who are on different levels. Maybe I want to make sure to separate them into certain things. So I want to have strictly just see does caffeine affect it or not. Um, okay, other thing um, is 
they wanted to get into, but I didn't really see it. So blinding, uh, I want to make sure that people maybe don't know what they're getting, like in this case. So maybe if people think that they're getting caffeine, Coca-Cola, and that's what I'm measuring, like they get worked up and like their blood starts going. So I want to give people, um, another thing I want to do is maybe I give some people, so some people get like, uh, caffeine free Coca Cola. So some get caffeine free, others just regular Coke. Jeez. Regular Coke. Um, what that is called, when I want to do that, that's called like. Uh, a blind experiment. So if I was giving y'all just a container of Coke, uh, I would have some that are caffeine free, some that are not, and that's going to help me like have, y'all are going to have limited bias in that case. Like the human error can be kind of taken out when you're doing that. So by blinding, kind of taking out that human element a little bit. Let's see. So design an experiment to test the effect of caffeine on a heart rate. So we're going to do similar, like draw a picture and just like split them into your groups, your diagrams. So design an experiment, uh, basic effect. So let's say I have 50 students. So those 50 students are all at a different spot on that day, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly assign them so that those groups have equal uh, kind of some people, the, they, they're both representative of our class. So like I'm not, I'm trying to make them both have the same to each other. Like not have one group have all the caffeine addicts and one, one group, no one's had caffeine that day. So I randomly assigned to two different groups. So group one, group two, they have the same number of people, like 25 and 25. Uh, I spell out that one group is gonna get the Coca-Cola. So one group drinks Coke, one, one group is gonna drink Caffeine free Coke. And then I'm going to sit here and I'm going to compare the pulse rate at the end. That one would be like I'm limiting. I'm limiting the uh, factors. I'm trying to get equal groups by randomly assigning them, and then compare results. Right. Let's see. Sweet. So you got control groups are kind of our baseline effect. Uh, you've got like blind testing here, so groups don't know which one they're getting. So blind testing kind of helps take out some human error element to it. Uh, and then the placebo effect, which is a pretty common thing that y'all probably heard of already, is just when someone's acting like, or someone truly does have an effect, but it's just like their mind is playing a trick on them because they shouldn't have had increased pulse rate from no caffeine. Um, sweet. So, uh, the check your understanding on this one, it was kind of confusing from the big old paragraph there when we did it in the second period. So I'm going to try and do it a little different before, oh yeah, we don't get out until 46, so we'll be great. So let me, what's happening in this uh, is 
this is a utility company, and the utility company is trying to, dis to see if they can affect how people use energy, if they can kind of lower the energy use in a household. So the way that they're gonna do this is they're gonna give some people like uh, a digital reading of how much energy, energy they've used. They're gonna give some people like a way to read the, uh, the energy meter outside. So like there's a meter outside of our houses and no one knows how to read it. But they're gonna give you a way how to read it. And then the last group is just gonna be people who just live like normal. Okay, so I'm gonna actually kind of flip this around here. So we're gonna create the outline first. So I think in the thing, in the paragraph it says that there's 60 households. So I have 60 households and I'm an energy company trying to do an experiment here to see if I can limit energy use. So on this one, I actually have three groups that I'm gonna split out. Um, and again, I want to, every time I do this, I wanna point out that I randomly assign those groups. So I'm gonna have a group of 20, group one, group two, and a group three, with 20 households in each. And then, so actually like right above it here, what's the purpose of randomly assigning treatments? Uh, it would be to get like roughly equal representation of grouping. Like I'm gonna have households that have high energy usage, low usage, um, all in one. So, uh, I don't think, right? I think B line. Okay, so to have equal groups of electricity use. So like inside of those groups, there's gonna be a mixture of households who have the lights on all day long and some who never turn the heater or AC on or whatever. So I have a mixture. Uh, okay, so then group one, two, three, so in one group, I'm just gonna let them kind of live as they are. That's gonna kind of be my control group. Um, so group number one is basically like no treatment. So they're just gonna kind of keep living. Nothing happens. Uh, the second group is they're gonna get this like advanced technology with this digital reading saying here's where you're at on energy use. So they get this digital uh, energy use thing. And then the last one is, the, the last group of people are going to learn how to use, learn how to read their uh, outage meter outside. So second group of people is reading um, meter outside. And we're gonna see, in the end, we want to then come back together and compare the amount of energy use, the energy use between the two. So compare energy use. So that's your basic experiment. Um, you have a household, or you have a group, you randomly split them up so that they're equivalent, and then you give some, one treatment to another, one treatment to a different group, and then in the end we come back together and compare the two uses. Uh, so on number, on letter A, explain why it's important to have a control group that didn't get anything. That one helps us get like our baseline, like, 
how much energy do we really use? So a control group sets a baseline energy use. So if the other groups are roughly equal to this group, then it means nothing really changed because this is just the people who are living like normal. Wouldn't it be better to just see how they were using energy before, like track how they were using energy before they got the meters and then after? Like on their bill almost? Yeah. Yeah, you could do that as well. Yeah, couldn't do that. Or, yeah, if you didn't, but the problem is too, you can kind of, you can kind of get caught up with that, like the month of September was different than the month of October. All of a sudden, we're all turning on our heat at night, and July was like 100 degree temperatures near the AC is working really hard, and June wasn't working that hard. So it's kind of hard with that. So maybe you want to get all the groups tested at the same week or month to kind of get the same temperature. So, but it's different. You can do different things. Uh, okay, so then B is just randomly assigning them, is just doing a simple random sample for each of those. I guess we are missing lunch right now because someone's at my door. So you just do a simple random sample. So what that would be is number the households 1 through 60, and then use calculator to get 20 random households here, 20 random households here, 20 random households here. So number 1 through 60. Use calculator to get 20 random numbers for each group. Okay, so you still use that SRS approach. So that's all I got, this kind of basic intro experiment. On Monday, we're going to look at blocking experiments and match pairs. Kind of go from there. And yeah, I think lunch. Maybe I need to check with some other 